Our self-sufficient garden here in the Byron Shire, Australia, has really come along. The chickens have moved in, just feeling really comfortable. Karen's happy to take care of them. She hangs out with them most days. And I am working on the worm farms now so I can get more sustainable and start producing free fertiliser. Microgreens and baby leaf are still the major crop. And when they're harvested, now the trays are starting to go into the worm farms. This is an amazing way to save money and recycle all your compost. All these roots and material, the worms really love that. And they'll turn that into a really good fertiliser over time. So the top tier of this worm farm is absolutely cranking. But what I want to do is show you level two where we put the sugar cane before. This is like amazing stuff. This is all spent, well, basically worm castings now from the sugar cane. And a little bit of food went in there. Not too much, but look how good that stuff is. And they're still all moving through it. So still got a bit more to go, but you could really start using that in your gardens as a self-sufficiency plan already. Just get the worms out first. So this is the top part, the top tray. And uh, you can see there's quite a bit of food in here. And they're really, really, really hungry. Move down in this bottom section, down here you can see heaps like that. I'm talking some serious amounts of compost worms breeding in this top tray here. It's just unreal. They're literally just everywhere, riddled all through this top tray. Hooking into that apple pretty hard, I knew they'd get into that. Anyway, I'm gonna cover this back over so I stop disturbing them. All the little wisps will go inside that banana soon. Nice little wisp there already, you can see feeding on the banana. I know my chickens would love to get into this. They just think it was worm heaven. So this is the very bottom tray of the Taj Mahal worm farm. There's hardly any worms in it. There's castings in here. It's all done. And you don't need to collect all the worms out of it because they've moved up through into the next trays. And as you can see, the middle tray here has some worms in it. And they're still in here feeding on this carbon, which is basically sugar cane. You can use any type of straw mulch, anything like that and then they move up and down between that and the first layer, which you saw the first layer had heaps of worms in it, right? So what's gonna happen here? I'm gonna harvest and collect all the bottom tier. I'm gonna use that here in my self-sufficient garden. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this one down to the bottom and start revolving them. So one of them's gonna have to get filled full of sugar cane very soon. Or some type of, you know, grass cutting or something like, you could probably use lawn. Probably use lawn cuttings, as long as it doesn't get too hot, just be a bit careful. A lot of nitrogen, heat up fast. Worms don't like it, gives off ammonia and gas and things like that. But to get more self-sufficient, you need one of these babies because you can then do your own fertilizer. I use that for the bales and the fruit trees and all different types of things. Get the worm castings out on the seedlings and the plants and the planting 
And man, I'm just using all my waste here and including it with the chicken soon, which I'm gonna update you more about that, how the chickens are getting involved in this whole self-sufficient gardening and creating the whole process, everything from bugs, the fertilizer, to creating extra awesome worm castings. All right. It's been an exceptionally cold and wet winter this year, so the plants haven't been doing as good as what I would like. But we are starting to feel some sunshine and some warmth, so it feels like spring is just around the corner. Come on girls, you can come out for a little bit just before I give you a feed, all right? It's not feeding time yet though. Dad's got filming to do. Here you go, have some grass. And of course they follow me down to the main veggie patch, exactly where I don't want them to go. Come on, off the garden. No chickens. With it being so cold, my cherry tomatoes have been struggling, but since we've had that little boom of sunshine last week, I'm starting to see some tiny little cherries come through, so stoked I'm gonna be adding them to the salads very shortly. Fruit Loops, I'm telling you, get in the way, you've got no patience. Down, down, come on brown one, you, stop it. Down, I can't get, I can't get the food while you're on there. Get off, off, fight me. Bunch of rat bags. Get down. Oh no, you're gonna go in. Get off there. All right, oh, no. oh man. Never seen a chicken so hungry in all my life. All oh, right. No. Eee! Chuk 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 chuk. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, chuk chuk. You've never been fed before. <laughs> no, you carry on. Better be lots of eggs today, girls. So you have to agree, my chicken's absolutely bonkers, right? But I'd do it. I could have just left them in the pen and then took the food over. Some ways I find it quite entertaining that they sort of come and run in and everything. They get so excited about food. It's like a big family, it's like a big Catholic family, all going in for a big meal all at once and the food's all put out on the table and whoever gets in first gets the feed. But anyway, the garden hasn't been like that at all. It's actually doing quite well. I'm just building this corner first, then I'm gonna expand out into the whole yard over time. Mostly fruit trees, different things, around the backyard, this is gonna be the main veggie patch. Now, why do I have the straw bales there? Well, I have the straw bales there because they're gonna build my soil profile. I've got a heavy clay here. There's lots of really good big native worms in here already, so that's really awesome. And I'm gonna build a soil profile up. So it's a bit like building a lasagna bed, but at the same time, I'm planting, and as the the bales are sort of decomposing down, the worms are coming up through, I'll release compost worms in here. Already have some in here already. 
and then I'll just keep planting more plants in the top. Now, the lettuce at the beginning is really great because it's just a shallow rooted plant. Now they dry out really quick, these bales on the top with the compost on top, so you've got to wet them down on a warm day, around about three times a day, because lettuce will go bitter if it doesn't get enough water into the leaf, and then your whole crop's ruined. But I plant like big masses of them, and I just pick lots of baby leaf. I love doing that, and then I let a few mature up, and grab those out, give some more space, and the baby leaf grows in. I get a lot. Now, the rocket arugula doesn't do so well in these systems because it has a longer root, and as soon as that root goes down, it dies off, and it just can't get the feed that it wants. But I just like putting them in there. And as you can see, it's not really something I can harvest from. I'm gonna cover it over with a whole lot more um, compost again soon, plant some other things into it and get it going. But it is getting a root system in there. Now, I've had some mushrooms sort of appear on the sides already. Um, I do release a little bit of fungi into the system. You don't have to. It'll naturally come through the soil over time, but I have some lying around, so I put that in there. Now, I drench the tomatoes and the, the fruit trees in the bags because they're in those bags. They basically need a lot of moisture because they dry out quick. And every time you produce moisture in there, that nutrient will sort of like leach out through, it'll get attached to the roots and it'll suck up through. It's a little bit different to how plants grow in the ground that are photosynthesizing and sharing the good microbes and bacteria and things from a living soil. You're actually inside one of these plants, you need to release water. And so the nutrients can be uptake a bit like say like hydroponics or something like that in a way, or you know, doing an aquaponic system. It's exactly the same thing, flood and drain, flood and drain. And these guys, since I've been doing that, they're doing much better. So what would be my top tip for today if I was talking about getting more self-sufficient? Now, it's really hard to get 100% self-sufficient, but we can grow quite a lot of food in a small space and expand out slowly. Now, if you put yourself sort of here, there and everywhere, you don't pay attention to the garden and you're not building the soil profile up. So that's why I've just done this little space here. I'm building this soil profile up right here. I'm gonna get all the microbes, the fungi going, everything really well. And then eventually that will spread out into the garden. It creates these highways, right? Where we'll move out through and everything starts getting interconnected. We start connecting everything up and the mathematics of it all just accelerates everything. It's just absolutely awesome when it does that, right? So this patch is the main patch and then fruit trees sort of over there. So start off slowly, build your soils up, work on the little space that you've got and then you feel like you've got more time you can manage it better then move out into the next section and that's my best tip for today for starting to get self-sufficient you'd be really surprised what you can grow in a small space like you saw how much lettuce i've got just on those two bales there there's plenty enough for a family of four no worries harvesting nearly every day out of a bale like that if you've got a bigger family just add a few more bales, add a few more pots, and boom, man. Salads and herbs are the best thing you can do when you first get started. So this chicken coop, it moves around the yard. I can give them fresh grass every day, and I can also fertilize certain patches. Now, I'm getting three to five eggs a day. Karen and I don't eat that many eggs, so we're blessing a lot of people around the neighborhood and our friends with eggs. And also, I'm getting a lot of manure out of this back part in here uh, where they perch at night. I'll put some cardboard down, throw that into the worm farms, put it onto my pot plants, and soon, just with the worm farming and these chickens, I'm gonna have more than enough than I need for this whole backyard. I won't be spending much money, just a little bit on chicken food. So I'd have to say that this worm farm is getting me closer to becoming more self-sufficient in my space here. I know I'll never be 100% self-sufficient, but I'm saving a lot of money. I'm already growing quite a lot of food. And these little guys haven't really started working as hard as they should. I only turned up with 2,000. Now, I had hundreds of thousands down on the work site. 
a lot of people will be thinking, Marty, you're pretty crazy leaving that many worms behind. And, and I agree in some regards. But, you know, I only had two weeks to move out of where I had on my own with no help and into this place, you know, uh, gee, six-hour drive away. And I tell you what, it wasn't any easy feat. So I had to cut a lot of corners. And look, to be honest, I wasn't sure if I wanted to be uh, worm farming again uh, to, to make it as an income, as a business. But I wasn't sure either. So, I, you know, I'm sure either. And I thought, I've got to bring something with me. So I bought this one worm farm, the sugarcane worm farm. This is the uh, Taj Mahal method that I use. If you haven't seen the video for that, you need to watch it. I'll put it up here, the Taj Mahal worm farm. That's what I'm running here. Now they've chewed through all the sugarcane like no tomorrow. And a lot of this is ready to go onto the bales and into the ground into the new worm farm uh, over the side that we're building at the side of the house here. And also, uh, I'm going to be building worm farming stations around the place. This is, you know, I'm going to put a sub pod down. We've got one of those, these sub pods, send us a sub pod, so thank you for that. And, yeah, we'll start building some of the biggest worm farms ever systems, start repairing the soils. You know, the chickens are going to play a big role in that as well. And this, the process of everything speeding up is going to be, it's just going to be unreal. And anyway, we'll have a look uh, inside this worm farm and I'll show you how the sugar cane is broken down into worm casting. It makes a great casting, to tell you the truth. Let's have a look inside. <laughs> Let's look inside, shall we? All right, so Hessian blanket, blanket, love those. If you're not using the cardboard method with the egg cartons, this works really well. And then lots of little baby worms all through here. And this is basically broken down sugarcane mostly and it's created a really nice healthy habitat for these worms and a really great casting feels really good in my hands and look there's a little yellow tail on the end of that one and if you can see that which means it's a tiger worm and nice big clotellum there's a little cocoon there next to my thumb there and I've only grabbed one handful so that's a really good sign now a lot of people would come in here and take this out of here too soon. And look, it's just in the process. So you can see that little cocoon there, right? It's warming up. Now we're going into spring and there's another cocoon just there um, and another one. So I'm just spotting them on top underneath this blanket. And as this material, as this casting is breaking down, it's still quite fibrous. It's still got some food in there for them. Ah, oh, they're dropping lots of cocoons. I can see another cocoon there. So I'd be crazy unless I was going to be extracting cocoons out of here to harvest this, right? Um, underneath this banana here. Look at this, all the baby wisps in here. So I'd be crazy to harvest this at the moment. Uh, I'm just going to leave that be and let all those cocoons go. Then I'm going to grab handfuls of it and start moving this around to create other worm farms because there's cocoons and stuff in there. It's already got the good bacteria and everything in there. There's the microbes, the whole lot, and the worms are super healthy. So really excited uh, about that. Production's going to come up uh, big time. They're getting all through this blanket. It's a, it's a uh, more cocoons. I can see them all under that blanket there. It's absolutely insane. So let's lift this off and um, have, give you a better look inside at a, a stage where it's more broken down and there probably won't be as many cocoons. Oh, geez, man, I'm telling you, it's mighty heavy. Oh, I'm going to put it on the, um, I'm going to put it on top of my sugarcane bale because if any bale out down below, they're going to go down into the sugarcane because they always scoot down when they see light. So let's do that. I'll show you an idea. Onto here, right? There's some uh, cocoa peat, just from some microgreens here. There are worms in it. Lift that onto there. Some will go down. So as some of the worms are going down into the bale, we're going to have a look inside this farm, this section of the farm as well, which is basically nearly just all sugarcane. I haven't put anything else in here. There hasn't been any other food or anything like that. And I'm seeing some nice brown cocoons here. So 
that means that it's nearly ready to hatch that cocoon which is absolutely unreal and hopefully the camera is getting it and I'm seeing a few on top here I'm seeing like a some type of leech thing on top here this they actually like they call them a leech but it's some type of worm I believe and you do see him in worm farms from time to time not worried about him put him back in and yep yeah, I'm seeing more cocoons uh, on top and so this actually material will be going into the bale gardens right i'll be feeding the bale gardens with this uh, on the top putting a layer on the bale garden when it's wet and then you can see like it's ready to go like it's just making that sort of putty look to it which it gets that shiny surface and you can mold it it's ready to go there's basically no food left in that and it's just full of great awesome bacteria lots of minerals and nutrients and things for plants now that would that one ball would do a massive big pot you only need 10 percent of your castings right into an area so that it would do a, a pot about yay big just that alone so it'll cover a lot of area and as i put it on top of the castings the castings on top of the bale then what's going to happen is is any worms or cocoons or anything in there that are locked in there they'll just go down into the bale and we've created another habitat another home and another feeding station nutrient station for the plants so we'll go down to the bottom tier now right where the tap and everything is well getting closer to the tap and I'm going to put this on top of my other farm so more sugarcane broken down again. Look at that. It's the same. Looks almost the same. There is the odd worm in here and stuff. So this again will be scooped out and put on top of the bales or moved around into areas where when the worms escape or whatever in here, they can still live and survive and thrive as long as they've got mulch and a bit of food around and it's nice and damp for them. But lots of nutrients in here. And uh, yeah, this is just going to be jam-packed oh it's just power to make plants grow actually like we've got this plant here this um this one here let's give it a bit of that and mix it in that's our uh, watercress and then we've got some vietnamese mint there growing so that'll feed that system down in there and oh man that that is so good so rich I can't stress how good that stuff is, and it was virtually free. Whew. So you told me, <laughs> there's my breath there. So you saw me talking about this already, if you've been listening and not skipping the video. Inside this bale, there already are compost worms. And I see them because I put the black lids on top and the trays on top, and they hang underneath the black plastic, trying to get moisture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually put a whole lot of these castings. I'm going to create a layer on top of here. Now, <laughs> this is pretty great, pretty crazy stuff. Um, but you'll see what I mean uh, in time, how well this goes. Now, I just saw a big worm there. I'm going to leave him right there and just cover this layer here. Now... This cocoa fibre here on top, I'm just going to put it straight on top of that uh, as well. The cocoa fibre holds a lot of moisture. The worms are like that. And just create this layer. There's an eggshell, no problem. Just break it up a bit. Get extra calcium for the plants. And there's a lot of calcium in this already. So the tomatoes, if they get planted in here, they won't get any blossom end rot. Now... You always get a bit of plastic from cardboard lying around. I don't need to bin that later. Put this layer right across like this. Oh. So, I'm going to put this worm farm on top of here, on top of the castings for the moment. They're going to move down into the bale. They'll hit the castings. They're used to that, they, so they, just, they won't feel threatened in any way. They'll dive down into the bale, hang under there, move up and down the worm farm. If you want to have it like that, I feel a bit weird looking like this, but here we go. Still filming, still getting the content out to you guys. And look, you could build a worm farm just like this with multiple tiers all around the place and a bale down below. As long as the bale's nice and moist. It's been raining a lot here. This thing is super damp. 
and it's got a lot of good bacteria and stuff in it already that the worms will feed on. It's just another way to create a worm station and then grow more plants in it. You can grow them out of the side if you want. Worms in, the, in there, plants growing outside. Mate, tell you what, get creative with this and your plants are going to love you for it. Come on girls, you can come out for an afternoon stroll. There you go. Spring is well and truly here, and the days are warming up, and the plants are absolutely loving it. So it's time to get started to build part two of my bale and worm farm garden. Yes, my self-sufficient garden. I'm so excited, to be honest. Oi, get out of that. Come on, out of the way. Up you go. Come on, come on. And my compost worms are going to play a huge role because what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a whole new section using the Taj Mahal method, but connecting it to the bale garden. So I'm just there. Yeah, I'm a bit beyond myself. I'm just extremely happy, and I think you're going to see something truly amazing that I've never done before. So it's all about improving my systems over time. And I really believe that this is just going to be something that is just amazing. Wait until about three months and see what's going on here, man. I'm telling you, this is just going to be what I used to say in videos a long time ago, the bomb. Now if I help find your worms, you're going to give me eggs, right? That's the deal. Don't get your head chopped off while you're at it. This one, get him. Oh. Get him. Oh. To be honest, most of the time I'm doing this, I'm so worried that they're going to get under the matic. So I keep on moving around from place to place so they don't get underneath me because the last thing I want to do is hurt one of my girls. But I just love diving in and getting these fresh worms. Okay, so I've moved over to another part of the garden. We've got a bit of cloud cover, but it's, it's nice and warm. And I thought, you know what, I need to show you what else is going into the garden. Uh, because I haven't really gone over a lot of the plants that are giving you too much of a tour, really. We need to do that in the near future. But first, let's have a look at the new plants that are going in the garden. Now, I just had what's in the truck uh, for that video, so the things that are coming in. And here's some of the plants that we had. But if you want to watch what's in the truck, it's up here. I'll leave it in the link. Watch it at the end or something like that, end of the video. Right, so this one, this one is called a uh, indigo rose. I had to read that again just to remember. Now, I'm hoping that this is the cherry tomato variety. It grows anywhere from 1.5 to 6 feet tall, so nearly 2 metres. Got some stakes for it. I'm going to grow one up the pond vine, and I'm going to let the rest bush out uh, down the bottom. Now, if this is a really good plant, uh, I might try and not cross-pollinate other ones and keep growing this, hopefully, into the future as a cash crop, because I've done it before. The red and black cherry tomato, I'm pretty sure this is the cherry tomato variety. 
and uh, man, exceptional, exceptional fruit. Looks really beautiful on the plate and the flavor. Mm, Bellissimo, I think they say in Italy. Now, here's another interesting plant, the cucumber. Now, the cucumber's been doing really well on the East Coast the last couple of years because of La Nina. Uh, we get more cloud cover, so we get a filtered light, a softer light. Now, they are prone to some different viruses and things from too much water. So, got to be a bit careful with that with the extra rain and stuff. But let's hopefully it doesn't get any sooty mold. If it does, you spray a bit of milk on it. You know, just a light mixture, and that usually helps if you get it early. If it gets in and it's fully all over your plants, uh, look, you just got to rip them out and pull them, throw them away, basically. So that can happen with too much humidity, too much rain. Now, we've got a Roma here. This is really cool. Now, just one plant. It cost me two bucks, this one. It was a bargain. So what I did was... What I did was... What I'm going to do is I'm going to plant this one out. One Roma, I'm going to grow, you know... I want to make different salsas and different recipes and things out of these plants. So it's a good idea to have a different type of tomato. I'm not sure if it's going to cross-pollinate with the others. That's the problem with when you're doing sort of small, in-close stuff. But, hey, no problem. You've got to do what you've got to do right now. The final plant here, yep, well, plants, I should say, is squash, button squash. Now, these grow fantastic out of a bale garden like i've got some other zucchinis that have went in i didn't show you the black jacks they've gone in next to the peas peas and the, um, the lettuce and stuff i'll be spilling out of the bales these just grow absolutely insane in bale gardens for some reason they just go mental and you get huge harvest from so probably giving a lot of these away be more than I can eat there but you know the rest you feed to the chickens give to friends things like that so plenty to devour from the button squash anyway let's keep going on in the garden here and mate it's an awesome day to grow food that's what I say so I've been getting a lot of questions about the what's in the truck video from the dolomite which I've got here which is magnesium calcium basically and dolomite's really a really cheap option and because it's got the extra magnesium I like it and it cost me a bit over eight bucks just for this 20 kilo bag and you know it's going a really long way it's probably one of the cheapest minerals that I've got that I can buy on the garden that I can use organically now I use it to break up my clay soils and also to bring down acidity in places and to condition my worm farms but the main thing today, really, I'm not just testing pH or anything like that. Soils from clays are generally a bit more acidic. So that'll break down over time and I'll be adding more sort of like manures and different things and the worm farm system and so many things to it. The pH is just going to slightly change all the time and hopefully just stay just a little bit acid, which is where I want for tomatoes and things. But what you do is you just grab a handful of this stuff and like that. And you just start covering the soil with it, right? And you just get a light coating, and then you wet it down, break it down a bit more with the matic, and just do that over a few days. You don't want to go too hard, too quick with it. You just add it slowly, get it right, and make sure that your structure doesn't go too fine. You don't want to break it down so you've got this fine-like mix. You want to keep a blocky soil, so that way it aerates, it keeps, it sits on top of each other like blocks, creates little air pockets for the roots to go through and for the oxygen to go through and you create better drainage that way and then you're building a soil. So that's what you do with it. Just keep adding it until you think it's right. You can always add a little bit more later and I always say less is better than more with this stuff. So just do it slowly and you'll find the soil just get more friable and friable over time until it's looking like a beautiful loam and you'll just be going wow. That's perfect now. So we've moved into stage two of the garden bed, right? So I've dug all the clay, put all the nutrients in as much as possible. Mostly just dolomite, really. I haven't added anything else. But clay is full of nutrients, right? So then the next stage is actually putting the worm farm, the Taj Mahal, on top of the bale. Now, if you haven't seen the Taj Mahal worm farm, you need to check out that link that's wherever around there and in the description. Check that out and you'll see what type of worm farm is going into this. And it's just an extension 
of that and making it bigger and bigger. So the worm farm will actually be feeding this whole system and I won't need to put too many inputs in because most of the inputs will be feeding the worms. The worms will then be making castings, turning over the carbon, spreading around all the good bacteria and fungi and you know microbes and all that great stuff and leaving their fertilizer behind, which is their little poops that they do called worm castings, which are wonderful stuff. They actually like full of microbes and great nutrients and slow release. So either way, it's a win-win-win. And I'm using all my inputs from the farm and from around the outside and from the chicken manure and all different types of stuff to get this rolling. And what I'll be able to do is I'll be able to actually plant plants underneath the bottom and around the edges of the bales in the garden, and as the bales are breaking down, I'm planting into those, the whole thing will be feeding and producing food really quickly and just getting better and better as it breaks down and the worms get more and more populated and we'll create one of those worm microbe highways that I was talking about and extend out to the next part of the garden. So stage two, it's rocking my friends, it is rocking. It's great to see. So as this is a vlog style production, right, you really need to stay tuned to the channel. YouTube will not share and let you know all the time that I have got content out, right? They will basically show you what they think you need to be shown to. So what I would recommend is you come back to the channel, you know, check it out weekly and then watch the updates. Because if you missed one section, you might go, oh, how did I do that? How did I do that? I've forgotten about this. I didn't see that. Because... I just basically can't put everything into one video. It's, obs it's absolutely impossible to do. All I can show you is the updates, the progressions, and the way things go. And unfortunately, YouTube doesn't really like that system. The algorithm doesn't work so good with that anymore. So you need to really just be diligent if you wanna keep learning and seeing what I'm doing here so you can possibly implement it at your place. So I'm gonna be producing a lot more content, hopefully in the near future big changes and I'm going to let you know what's coming up in the next video. So keep an eye on the garden bed number two. I'm going to call that number two section. We've still got to plant that out and start that to get ready. And we're just basically waiting for the chicken fence to come through. And once that does, we can really go hardcore because I don't have to worry about the chickens getting in and digging up stuff that I've planted and things like that. All right. So have a great day. Happy gardening. And we'll see you at the next video real soon. Don't forget, man, you've got to come back to the channel. YouTube won't always show you. Bye for now. Put that bulge in for you, eh? Keep you nice and dry. The dreaded La Nina rains are back on the east coast of Australia for the third season in a row. Now, this rainfall we had last night was over five times the predicted amount, and my backyard is fully inundated. However, we have some good news. The bale garden is okay because it's raised up high and in some ways it benefits because it gets to soak up all that water into the carbon. Also, the worm farm zone has got a real good soaking. So I'm gonna release a whole lot of cocoons into there, which will be equivalent to around about 1,000 worms once they populate their space. <laughs>
So finally we had a couple of days of sunshine and the yard was able to dry out. So we were able to erect the portable chicken fence. So thank you guys for that. You guys are just absolutely awesome and uh, I'm so grateful for it. We also put some tomato steaks in the ground so we can start using the vertical space in the vegetable garden. I'll tell you what, it's good to see a few dry days. Now, the chicken fence, yep, it's up. She's roaring. The girls are out. They busted out once this morning. I left a little gap underneath the fence and they got in and made a bit of a mess in this garden here. But we've got them enclosed in. They seem happy enough. And they've got a little, few little trees to hide under the plant side and they can run under the coop. They can scoop around and do their thing and they've just got a bit more freedom. But they are some of the most painful chickens I have ever come across in my life. And I think I may have trained them incorrectly by noise of rattling the seed. So whenever I'm getting the seed out of the bin, they hear it, they come running if they're around and out and they jump all over the garden, they jump on the lettuce, jump. They just go absolutely mental for this stuff. Now, as hilarious and entertaining as it all sounds, it can be a bit of a nightmare, to tell you the truth. But they're laying eggs, they're doing their job in the coop, stirring that all up because I'm going to be planting more fruit trees and different things down the back in there, building that garden space. Then we'll shift that fence to somewhere else in the garden where they can get access to new green grass and different things and start stirring up and plowing in and doing their thing, fertilizing and doing what chickens need to do, work for you. So how am I getting started into my self-sufficient systems here? Well, microgreens, growing them in trays, recycled containers, seven to 14 days, baby leaf crops, you know, two weeks to three weeks you're harvesting it's just insane on how quickly they grow i'm doing them in my bale gardens but you can do them in pots and all different types of ways i'm planting all my herbs in the pots and off into the ground and getting my annuals ready now so i can harvest them into the spring and take food into the kitchen now importantly i've actually actually planted my fruit trees yep the perennials. Now perennial crops are super important to get started early because you want to have food going on forever and once you plant them and get them in the ground you feed the soil from the top make sure you prep the soil obviously when you plant them feed from the top and they will just keep giving and giving for years and years to come. So the bale garden at the back here is just about done as far as the beginning of the leafy greens. I'm going to have to go through and do a big harvest for a whole lot of the chickens, keep some for myself, and then leave some in there so they'll regrow out and give them lots of space. And then once they're ready to be harvested in the final harvest, I'll look at planting some tomatoes and different things in there. That's why we've got the steaks up, peas, beans, tomatoes, use that vertical space and start taking advantage of this little area here and turn it into a little mini ecosystem. I'm not far off harvesting some tomatoes out of containers, so I'm really stoked. And plenty of herbs coming out of here too now. It's just, I've got to say, living the dream is just wonderful. So I'm curing these bales now. They've been sitting out for around about three weeks. Put some compost on top, letting it soak down into there. I'm seeing the odd mushroom coming up now. I've done a cover of cow manure from the local paddock. I'm going to let that soak in a bit. Still not ready to plan out yet. I could put some seeds in here, get some small crops and things like that. But I'm just going to wait a little bit longer. The worm farm here going into the bale. I checked the other day, well actually yesterday, and there's some worms at the top of the bale now. I'm throwing in a whole bucket every day into this farm, and I put a layer of cow manure on top of the sugar cane, and they're going mental in here, laying lots of cocoons. I reckon in about three weeks to a month, this bale is just gonna be alive, full of worms. And I've gotta figure out what I'm gonna do then. Do I move this? How many worms are in there? Hmm. Still too early time to tell, but 
I reckon I'm on the right path with it. They're going to move through these bales and, man, exciting times. I'm just looking forward to seeing how well this self-fertilizes. Actually, I know how well it does because I've done something similar before. It rocks.